Herb had a distinguished military career, a sterling academic career, and as I mentioned before, was Professor Emeritus at Pacific Union College in journalism. Ordained as a minister uh, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he's also an activist in Angwin, not only Angwin, the entire area here. He's a civic activist, very well respected, very well known, and as you all know, he is a delightful and wonderful person to meet. Herb is a prolific author of 11 books, uh, of which we are proud to own some. He founded the Pitcairn Islands Study Center here at Pacific Union College in 1977 and is the director. And I have a big thank you to Anita Ford for sparing Herb to work on the conference so diligently and took up a lot of time. But um, Anita, the conference will be over tomorrow evening and you can have him back. <laughs> The second edition of Pitcairn Island as a Port of Call, 1790 to 2010, uh, Herb's remarkable book, uh, was just published again, second edition, in 2012. And uh, he's going to speak to us on Pitcairn's survival by ship. If you'll see on the back cover of your program, Pitcairn Island as a Port of Call, that's our Herb. Okay. I see we're starting a little later, so you'll, you'll give me a little more on the end. Maybe. <laughs> ah, greetings again. It's good to be with you. Uh, I uh, wrote my talk out thoroughly, uh, literary beauty and all the rest, and and um, it's in Ted Sands now. And I tried it out on my wife a little bit at home and, and uh, started reading away. And she stopped me after a while. It's boring, she said. <laughs> and, and I began to think about that she said, he said thing, you know, from the, from the retirees. She said, what are you doing today? And he said, nothing. And she said, but that's what you did yesterday. And he said, but I'm not finished yet. <laughs> well, that's the way things go. Um, Kari this morning uh, talked about Pitcairn's resourcefulness. And she was right on, spot on, as we would say. And uh, yet I think there's something more to the Pitcairn resourcefulness that accounts for the survival of Pitcairn Island today. Uh, my study of the maritime history of this island uh, tells me that there are scores, even hundreds, of ships <coughs> that uh, contributed to the survival of Pitcairn beyond the resourcefulness of the people themselves. And uh, they, uh, those ships, the captains that commanded them, the people that went on them as passengers in many cases, the people who in towns provided material on those ships to Pitcairn, all of those were instruments in my mind of the survival of Pitcairn Island. I've studied a little more than 3,500 ships to do this little book that we just talked about. And uh, that all the way from the first recorded call that we have that stopped at Pitcairn in 1795 until the Plessy, which called uh, on December of 2010 when we, when we stopped our study in the book. But of course, before 1795, uh, we'd have to say there was a ship that con uh, con contributed to the survival of Pitcairn Island. It was called HMAV Bounty. And uh, off of that ship came clothing and seeds and all kinds of things that uh, meant that that tiny colony uh, could survive. Uh, I just wonder, uh, you know, how much survival there would have been without what came off of the bounty, because it was, uh, it was all they had, really. 
Uh, but through the years, of course, we've seen all kinds of material come in that have contributed from actually, uh, uh, I, I don't know how many ships, but, but you could put it well in the, the thousands, I think, maybe, maybe up to 2,000 ships that have brought material to Pitcairn. They brought food and medicine, dunnage timber for the homes uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of good things came, including thousands of big, fat Polynesian rats came to Pitcairn Island. And of course, uh, the rat has been, through the recent years, quite a bane of, uh, of the island. Uh, the, uh, the ships that have come, uh, have, of course, in my mind, sometimes they almost themselves they were the agents of the survival. I think of the Southern Saver that came to Pitcairn uh, in April of 2005, uh, brought that heavy cement mixer, brought that big rock crusher, and then the Pitcairn men cobbled together that uh, wonderful barge that they stuck right into the salver and <laughs> put those two items, one after the other, onto their barge, and they were wondering if the whole thing was going to sink when they got it off the ship, you know, but it, it stayed up, and they got it to shore, and uh, as a result of uh, that, we have now a paved road all the way up the Hill of Difficulty, all the way through the village, and only those of you who have been to Pitcairn before that work was done uh, can appreciate the, the clouds of dust that came in the summertime in the village and on the road and the mud, the beautiful red Pitcairn mud that uh, sticks forever, just will not go away. <clears throat> then uh, to uh, the ships we need to add a long line of Royal Navy, Navy vessels that came. Uh, we think of the Portland and the Hyacinth, the Constant, the Virago, the Spy, the Calypso, the Opal, uh, many of them sent by that wonderful friend of Pitcairn Island, uh, Admiral de Horsey. Uh, I'm telling you, without those ships, Pitcairn might not have survived. And then, of course, in more recent time, we had the Blue Star ships. And any time a Blue Star ship would appear off Bounty Bay, it was a joy because all the Blue Star ships had surgeons aboard, and uh, they knew that there was, there was help, medically help, uh, in that. And of course, uh, the medicine chests on the, on the Blue Star ships were, were terrific and helped too. And of course, there are a lot of other lines. We think of the city line that really would have done uh, an awful lot through its ships that called at Pitcairn also. Um, then, of course, there was, there was the kind of fortuitous things that happened. Uh, we think in, uh, <clears throat> in 1939 of the North Star that came by with Admiral Richard E. Byrd aboard. And uh, finding the Pitcairners at that time uh, destitute of food and, and uh, a number of medicines and things like that. And uh, that big-hearted admiral, uh, a hero of the Antarctic, you know, uh, just kind of opened up the ship and said, here, here you are. And uh, when they left, of course, they, while, while they were there, they overhauled the radio receiver on Pitcairn, which was a tremendous help. And uh, then uh, as they left, they took away uh, the chief magistrate, uh, Arthur Christian, who had a terrible eye problem at the time, and they took him away and they got to the hospital to be helped. Uh, so the ships helped. Uh, tremendously, and then along with the people that commanded those ships, you know, never, never be any help without that. Uh, and those people were interesting people. You take the case of the, the young sailor, for example, <clears throat> an apprentice on uh, Ellerman and Bucknell's uh, uh, steel screw steamer called the Katuna, came to Pitcairn first in 1919, just a young guy. And uh, when he left Pitcairn on that ship, uh, he had hardly no clothes left because he traded all his clothes for Pitcairn fruit. 
said that he had his bed so loaded down with pit and fruit he could hardly sleep in it anymore, you know. And uh, so that was, a, that was a great uh, blessing for him at that time. And uh, since that time, that, that young fellow uh, did a tremendous amount for Pitcairn. Uh, he did so much so that his fellow captains and commodores of the line he served, uh, the Shaw, Savile, and Albion, uh, began to call him Pitcairn. Pitcairn Jones, they called him. And uh, why not? Because he did, through the years, wonderful things. Uh, here's what the Fiji Times said about uh, Arthur A. Jones. Uh, it said, Captain Jones, a master mariner of 32 years sailing experience between Britain and New Zealand, is teaching Pitcairn Islanders how to stop their, stop their island from, being, from disappearing into the sea by erosion. Cause of the erosion was the number of half wild goats which roamed the island, eating the fresh vegetation. Captain Jones voluntarily undertook the task of teaching the islanders how to prevent their island disappearing underfoot about five years ago. <clears throat> he took a small shipment of young trees to the island. This shipment was successfully planted by the islanders and on each trip from New Zealand since then, he has taken more, mostly Norfolk pines, but also several other kinds and most recently wattle seedlings. Trees grow three times as fast on Pitcairn as they do in New Zealand, Jones commented. Protective fences were erected around each tree to prevent the goats from calling on them, and the children on the island were each given a tree to look after. That, of course, was the, the secret, because you get a child to look after a tree, the parents can't stand to have the child, you know, not have his tree going, and so they'll get in there and help with the trees too. So Jones changed an erosion-written, uh, barren-looking island out there in the Pacific uh, to one that turned green. And today we see most of Pitcairn green. We could want it all to be green, but so be it. Uh, other people did for Pitcairn in a wonderful way. Um, Dr. Brick John uh, Southworth uh, came, you know, in the 1930s in the Yankee. And we have some people here who sailed in the Yankee. Who, who, who's here who sailed in the Yankee? Yeah, there you are, right there, see? Okay, well anyhow, Brick came out and uh, with the Yankee and he gave some medical treatment while the Yankee was there, but then he went back home and he voluntarily went back for six months to treat long-term illness on Pitcairn Island. And uh, he wrote a lot of letters while he was uh, out there doing that and they're bound in a little book, and they're right outside here. Uh, letters from Pitcairn Island, 1937. You can get a copy of it if you want. So people like Brick did an awful lot. And uh, then, of course, there's the little American missionary teacher, uh, Hattie Andrew, who went out in uh, the early 1900s. She went out to teach, first non-island school teacher on the island, Seventh-day Adventist school teacher. And, uh, she came there to teach, but the moment she got there, a typhus uh, epidemic was going on the island, and uh, the Pitcairn people found her much more qualified as a nurse and a cobbler together of coffins in which to bury the dead rather than teaching. The teaching would come later. Um, and then we, of course, have that little 18-foot sloop that came out of Peru, and on that sloop, was a, a guy who had had a pretty good naval career already. His name was George Hun Nobbs. And uh, you know about Nobbs. He became ultimately the teacher, the pastor on the island, not only on Pitcairn, but when the Pitcairners moved to Norfolk, uh, he went on to Norfolk and, and became uh, helpful to them. Here's what, here's what uh, Nobbs wrote one time. Uh, about his situation at Pitcairn. He said, my stock of clothing, which I brought from England in 1828, uh, is, as you may suppose, very nearly exhausted, and I have no friends to whom I can with propriety apply for war. Until the last three years, uh, it was my custom to wear a black coat on the Sabbath, 
but since that period, I have been obliged to substitute an Ankeen jacket uh, of my own making. My only remaining coat, which is quite th threadbare, is reserved for marriages and burials, so that it is not customary to say when a wedding is going to take place, teacher, you will have to put on your coat next Sunday, which is equivalent to informing me that a couple is about to be married. So here we have Nobs, who became destitute, no clothing, nothing, on the island, gave up everything to help the Pitcairn people over years and years and decades, actually. And I submit that uh, there's no greater uh, help experience in the world from a Schweitzer or a Livingston or even a Tom Dooley than George Hunt Nobbs. He was really a helper. Yes, so we don't want to forget any of the people that helped Pitcairn in a special way, but always through the ships, through the ships. And of course, we've already heard mentioned today that roly-poly faced uh, fellow down in Cristobal Colombo, uh, or Cristobal uh, Panama Canal, uh, Gerald DeLeo Bliss. Here's a fellow who realized how long it took to get a letter to Pitcairn Island. You know, six months, a year, whatever. Some way there's got to be that we can stop this silliness, you know. And so he began to coattail every shipmaster that came into the island or into the canal and say, hey, you're going anywhere near Pitcairn? If you are, would you drop off the mail for us there? And he began to get some takers. And so the mail, instead of six months to a year, was going over in three or four or five weeks to Pitcairn. Wonderful situation. And then, of course, uh, the Pitcairners are always uh, quick to see a good thing. Uh, got a hold of his wife, Mrs. Bliss, and said, would you buy some stuff for us here and there as we need it? And so she would do that too. She became <clears throat> a hero of the help. Here's what Mrs. Uh, Richard Christian wrote uh, about what Gerald DeLeo Bliss did. We're getting letters from all over the world in a short time now. I received one from India per the Wangarila, written in August. This is the sixth dispatch of mails we have had forwarded to us by your kind husband. Never in this island's history have we been so kindly favored by anyone. Indeed, we do not feel as isolated as we used to be. So there's another little hero of Pitcairn. And then there was the black-hulled Nautilus, that sleek-looking trading vessel that came, <coughs> excuse me, out of Chile with its captain, Vincent Michelli. And uh, Vincent, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was, a, was a trader, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E and uh, he would come to Pitcairn, and, and if folk didn't have the money at the time for the trade they wanted off his vessel, he said, that's all right, just hold on until you get the money, no, no problem. And he would come back and back and back. One time he came back, and he had his wife, Rita, aboard, and she was fever-ridden. And he asked the Pitcairn women if they wouldn't kind of take care of her on the island. And they said, yes, we will. And they did, but it didn't prove too successful. And so today we find the gravestone of Rita Michelli there on Pitcairn Island, age 23. How about that? And then, of course, another one. The captain of the navigator, George Palmer, came by, and uh, he came a number of times and uh, had his wife aboard, Eliza Palmer. And uh, she had consumption. And uh, he asked the Pitcairn folk if they wouldn't uh, help her. And they tried, but she was a dying person. And she did pass away. And uh, before she died, she, she knew that she was she was going to go. And so she uh, began to write some verse about her life now, the life she believed in the hereafter. And uh, that verse, after her death, got passed from one whaling ship to another all over the Pacific Ocean. Those days, the way they 
the way they talked between the whaling ships was called gamming, G-A-M-I-N-G. And uh, one whaling ship would come fairly close to the other and with a megaphone or whatever, or they might even send a little cutter or one of the whale boats over and talk. But those things got all passed around. And, and so Eliza Palmer's uh, verses got put all around and uh, ultimately made their way back to New Bedford and uh, in the East Coast and printed in the Whaleman's Shipping, shipping uh, News over there, which was the official newspaper of the whole whaling fleet of America at the time. Eliza Palmer was buried under what is today the public hall in uh, Pitcairn. <clears throat> and when Sean uh, uh, Burkaw was going out to Pitcairn one time, he said, Herb, is there anything you can have me do on Pitcairn? And uh, I said, yeah, I said, uh, Tom Christian tells me that Underneath the hall, there is a headstone of Eliza Palmer. Uh, Tom uh, can't get his frame underneath that little space there underneath, but if you could try to wiggle in there and take a picture, I'd really appreciate it. And Sean did that. Sean, I appreciate it. Uh, beautiful little, little picture. It's squanch-wise, but it's sure there, and that's, that's for sure. Um, so we remember all these good people who have done the good things. Then we need to remember uh, even shipping lines. We take the two, for example, that have been the most greatest help, no question about it, the Shaw, Savile, and Albion line, and then the New Zealand Ships and Company. And um, the directors of those companies told those captains of every one of those ships that went Trans-Pacific, you stop outbound from England to New Zealand, Australia, and stop at Pitcairn Island. You coming home, homebound, stop at Pitcairn Island. And think of what that did for the trade that the Pitcairners could do and the things that they needed. Uh, you think of the, the Rangi ships of the New Zealand line, the Rangitani, the Rangitiki, the Rangitata, and the Rangitoto, uh, the Rangi ships. And then you think of the ships of the uh, Shaw, Savile, and Albion line uh, the one of which uh, Arthur Jones was a part of the Iconics because there were more than just one ship with that name. There was Iconic 1, Iconic 2, and Iconic 3, and most of these ships had 1, 2, and 3 versions of them. The Iconics, the Athenics, the Corinthics, the Gothics, the Terramoros, the Acaroas, and the Coptics in the uh, Shaw, Savile, and Albion line. Thank you, Barbara. We got five minutes to go. Uh, uh, and um, to, to those lines, we need to add the people that made it happen, uh, that said the ship will stop, the captains. Um, these captains and many, many more made it kind of a sacred ritual almost. That they would stop at Pitcairn Island regardless. Um, and you know, today, today it's harder. You've got, you've got your container ships, and, and they're on an electronic schedule, you know, and you've got union rules, stop on a foreign port for half an hour, and you start paying triple time or something to your crew and everything else. All those things uh, don't allow it today as much as it used to. But the people in these lines uh, at that time uh, just made it a point that Pitcairn's going to be a place where we're going to call because we, we need to see if these people need any help or whatever. And uh, so to Arthur Jones, we would add uh, the names of such captains as J.J. Cameron, A.E. Lettington, George Kendall, E.H. Hopkins, uh, Bristow Forbes Moffat, and E.A. Holland. Uh, these plus many, many more were among those who wouldn't let a a thing go by without, uh, without stopping at, at Pitcairn Island. Uh, and lastly, of course, we would think of the people in places which so had the concern of Pitcairn Island that they would see that the ships that left their ports had, you know, stuff for Pitcairn aboard. And no place can we think of more so of that than the metropolis that's very close to us, San Francisco, the people by the Golden Gate. 
they poured tons of supplies of all kinds uh, to Pitcairn Island. Some of them, of course, in uh, repayment for uh, the help that Pitcairn gave to shipwrecked sailors, like uh, those who were on the Acadia, who went aground in Ducey, and uh, the Cornwallis right there on Pitcairn Island, boom, into the island, and uh, the Candish, the Oregon, the St. James. Uh, but most of the help that the people of Pitcairn poured into uh, Pitcairn Island was pure altruism, pure humanitarian help. And uh, they really not, should not have uh, been forgotten, I think, in, in the good things they did for Pitcairn. Uh, many, many, many a sailing ship leaving out of San Francisco for Liverpool or, or for uh, La Havre or for Falmouth for orders or for Queenstown or many U.S. East Coast ports, all of them were carrying clothing and, and uh, tools and food and medicine and rope, sailcloth, everything else for Pitcairn Island. So would Pitcairn have survived without the ships that uh, came, without the big-hearted captains who commanded them, without the people and places that brought the gifts uh, to the island? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, that's up to you to decide. But uh, regardless, I think we should say thanks and fair winds to all who had a part, to the crews, to the passengers, to the shipmasters, to the ships themselves, to the good-hearted people of a thousand ports and a hundred countries who have helped Pitcairn survive. We salute you. Thank you.